Welcome back to the Iron Sights Podcast. Special episode today. I got two very, very cool guests, uh, friends of mine. Got Raul Castillo from up here in uh, Half Moon Bay, which is where we're currently sitting. And JP, who you guys all know already. Boys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Today was, was, a, was an outstanding day. We got the day started early, headed up from San Jose, which is about 30 miles sort of southeast of here of where we're currently sitting. And uh, we got to meet up with Raul at his, at his gym where he has a sort of a, a burgeoning and very, very successful jujitsu coaching and martial arts business. Um, and I'll let him talk a little bit about that. But he was able to run JP and I through uh, just some basic stuff today, some basic you know, self-defense type maneuvering, uh, got us a little bit more familiar with some situational awareness. I think that was the theme of the day. Um, but, uh, then we got to kind of hang out and see the town a little bit. And here we are getting a chance to talk, man. I'm down to pick your brain on like what we talked about earlier in terms of like realistic training versus competition training. This, this game you've been in for the majority of your life, right? Let's talk about it. Like, yeah, it's a little background on where I come from. So I've been training martial arts my entire life since about four years old. I started with karate. Um, I competed heavily in karate until I was about 14 years old. Mm -hmm. um, took a little bit of break. You know, I was a teenager. Want to play hockey, hang out with my friends, you know, girls, that kind of stuff. And then I found jujitsu. Um, and I fell in love with jujitsu and I just couldn't stop. Well, basically, my friend kicked my ass and... <laughs> my and he trained jujitsu for six months and i've been training karate my whole life and i realized oh shit there's more than what i've been learning wait was this like is this like one of those typical dude fights like where you're just like you're wrestling in the front yard run, one day and then it gets a little out of hand and he whoops your ass or was it friendly or was this over some chick what happened pretty kind of the <laughs> latter um so basically <laughs> my friend kept on trying to taunt me in front of all these girls every time the girls come over and hang out in our friend's front yard you know, he'd always poke me and poke me and poke me. And I'm like, Fuck, dude, I can't fight. I'm, I'm honorable. I can't, I don't want to hurt you. So, you know, I'm the karate kid. You know, I've, I've, I've my black belt, I have like a hundred national titles. And, you know, you're, you're a hundred pounds less than me. I don't want to smash you. And then finally he just talked the, the shit he needed to talk to in front of the right girls. And I was like, dude, I'm going to go <laughs> smash this kid. And he fucking choked me. <laughs> and he fucking choked me. He went to my back, choked me. And that was it. I was like, holy shit. I didn't realize. Yeah, you know I didn't you know didn't what know. I didn't exactly. Yeah. I didn't know what I didn't know. And then I fell in love with jujitsu and, and I started training with them in the city with, uh, with Kurt Osiander and Half Gracie. And I remember like driving up there since I was 15 years old, you know, kind of slinking through the ghettos and, you know, avoiding people because they were in the, the middle of it. I don't know if people knew Valencia in the early 2000s, like 2000, yeah, the year 2000, 1999. But like the Mission Street, Valencia, it mm -hmm. wasn't gentrified yet. No. You know, it wasn't hipstered out. No, you didn't go down there. Yeah. The, and we, my friend had the red Corvette. I mean, the red Camaro with the T-tops and everything. I remember coming out one day. Just a target. Dude, the T-tops were gone. The windows were smashed. And it was literally on, on blocks. cinder blocks. Yeah. And it was on cinder blocks and all of his tires were gone. And we're like, wow, dude. We got, you got to be careful out here. And his mom was always talking to us. My grandma was like, no, I don't want you going out there. And But you went there. Why? Because I wanted to learn, I wanted to know what what real fighting was about, what real self defense and real martial arts was. Not martial arts, but like the aspect of fighting, the applicability and the effectiveness of what he did to me. Because again, I competed against a bunch of people since I was a young child. I was very successful. I trained in karate, and that's all I knew. And in the in the late eighties, early nineties, like that was the thing. You know, like they, everyone did. Karate, you want to be kickboxer, you want to be Van Damme, blood sport. Yeah. yeah. You know, Chuck it, Norris. It's so funny you bring that up because that's uh, <clears throat> JP's story is a little bit around that with regard to the firearms and his introduction mm -hmm. to him. I mean, he had him before, he'd been introduced to him before, but he saw some stuff, some cinematic stuff mm -hmm. that really, really, you know, drove his, drove his desire to kind of learn more. Um, but going back, like I remember those days, those movies were classics, man. And Van Damme, dude. Yeah, they still <laughs> hold up. They still hold dude, up. Blood sport. And, and you're right. It was like yeah. stuff we had never really seen before. Like mm -hmm. it, it really turned it up because as a, so I'm a bit older than you guys, but my dad's actually a black belt in uh, Shotokan. Um, and so I was introduced to martial arts very early, but it was very traditional uh, karate, right? And um, 
I thought it was the most awesome shit ever. My dad was, you know, growing up, my dad was a tough guy anyways, but I always respected that. And I always kind of held that very, very, in very, very high regard uh, until these movies start coming out. Right. Like, and you're starting going, wow, this is some, this is some shit. This is, this is different. Like that karate stuff. I'm not sure if it holds up at least what I had been taught. Like this is, this is wild. This is a little bit different. So you at a young age had gotten turned on to like, let's, let's, let's explore this a little bit more because clearly what I, what I've been taught isn't going to help me in every situation. So yeah, it was a fantasy. Like you, this is a thing that people have to watch out for when they're going into a dojo is, is this person, what is this person selling me? What is this person trying to give to me? What am I, what kind of product am I looking for? And I was, when I was a kid, I was looking for confidence, right? And most people are selling you fake confidence and a story and a, and a facade that makes you believe one thing and really it's something else. Like me, I thought I was unde- <clears throat> I was untouchable. I could not be defeated. Why? Because your trophies tell you so. Exactly. And all those experiences <laughs> that I had until you take all those rules out of the, you know, out of the equation and you make it real and you take the honor and the integrity and you make it more about like survival or winning, then the real stuff comes out and you see what actually really works. And that completely opened my eyes. And I just wanted to know about, I, I didn't, at that point, I didn't really care about martial. I just want to know about effectiveness, you know, and what was going to, what was real because everything beforehand was just magic. It was all fake. It was like, my, I was living in this bubble and this fake reality and all of a sudden, boop, I didn't know where I stood anymore. I was so confident, but it was so fake. And I believed it for so long. And then all of a sudden, you know, I don't know who I am. Anymore. Yeah, I was just going to say, almost like an identity crisis yeah. situation. And I, I, knew that I, I knew how to learn. But one thing I did remember about martial arts and karate that's super valuable is they might not be teaching you 100% effective martial arts, but they do teach you how to learn. And they teach you how to be detail-oriented And there's a structure. So you have to follow the structure. You have to pay attention to the details and you have to go through the sequences correctly. And that gave me the ability to see what jujitsu was. Cause I see people like I got my black belt in, in about five years, five and a half, six years. That's fast for jujitsu. That's really fast. Very fast. Um, it's only because I was training every day. I was young. I had support from my family and I knew how to learn. Right. I did. I wasn't the best in school. I hated school. Like I didn't want to do home, but I, if you I mean, picked, you mean like at academic academic school, Yeah, got you. But if I, I knew how to learn, I knew how to pick up information and I knew how to apply it. Like if, so, if one of my teachers was having a lecture in the class, I remember listening to the lecture saying, fuck this homework, going in and passing the test. And I remember telling him like, why aren't you guys just listening in class and doing the test? You don't have to do homework. You'll still get a B or an A, but you just got to listen in class. And I didn't realize that martial arts gave me the ability to learn to do, how to learn. do it that way. Yeah. And I didn't have to have, I didn't, I didn't struggle to absorb information because that was already beaten into me at such a young age doing no stance like this. No, twist your hand, knee over the toe, lock out your back leg, shoulders right. over your hips, punch in the center of the body. Don't smile. Whack with a stick. You know, like that kind of training prepares you for real training. And, um, I remember one of my other, uh, instructors in the gym, he has a hand to hand combat. He used to do, um, special forces tactics as well and training with, he used to be a ranger. Um, he talked about, uh, having karate be the precursor for weapons training because everything that you do in all the forms, an extension. You, right? Yeah. You're actually doing that, but you have to imagine you're doing it with a weapon in your hand. And then you teach the kids those techniques. And once they get to a certain age, then you put a weapon in their hand and you send them off to There's battle. A progression, yeah. And that's what the traditional Japanese martial arts come from, right? Like they were in feudal Japan. They were farmers and they had to learn how to fight against the imperial army. It's a way of life, yeah. Right? So they learned that way and they were doing those things and they put in basic tools in their hand after they learned the basic stuff. So they weren't super tough. Like they weren't battle tested yet, but they were preparing to get battle ready. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a great book on that actually by Musashi called, I think it's called, I think the title is um, The Five Rings. Yeah, mm-hmm. Book of Five Rings. Book of Five <laughs> Rings by, mm-hmm. yeah, Musashi. Uh, excellent book, but it talks about that. It talks about how people came up and where you were basically from a, from a class perspective and, and, and how it was a way of life and there were certain warriors that were developed 
that were above kind of everybody else. And so you're finding yourself turning into this warrior. So you find this, you find the school, you find this, this gym, you're working with some legends, by the way. Right. And where does it go from there? So you want to test yourself. You get a black belt in the, again, in the world of BJJ, that's fairly fast. Um, where do you take it from there? I wanted to fight. I wanted to test myself. I've, for me, I'm super competitive. I'm really, really competitive. And I always wanted to test myself and not just test myself. I just want to be, I wanted to be better than everybody. You know, like when you want to be, <clears throat> I don't think like this now, but I remember being 20 years old. I remember being like 25 years old and just having this dream of being the best and then believing that you're the best too and no one can defeat you and doing what it takes to get there. Um, I remember doing in the, in the time, I remember running up these hills, Higgins Canyon, there's a Prisma Park. It goes all the way to Skyline. You go all, I remember running these hills like when no one else wants, hey guys, you want to go on a run? Where are you going to go run? I'm going to go run up Higgins. Like, fuck you. I'm not going to go do that. Just wired different. Yeah. yeah. I, I just knew what it takes. And I, and I remember one of my coaches saying that if you want to be better than that guy, you got to do more than them. You can't get better than someone by doing less. You know, there's talents, of course, and things that, you know, gifts that you have. But at the end of the day, um, hard work beats talent, dude. Every time. Where did that come from for you? Like, where was that instilled? I mean, was that just something you intuitively picked up along the no, way? No, I think that's work ethic for my dad. Um, context on my dad. My dad came here from, from Mexico when he was about 15 years old by himself and, you know, basically worked his whole life so we could have a better life. And I remember growing up, watching him work so much. And then when we were really young, we lived, we weren't, we didn't have any money, you know, so he, we, we, didn't have money, you know? And so I had to work really hard in order to get stuff. And I remember moving from like a littler house to a really, really nice neighborhood. And it was because my dad wanted to us to have that life. So he was willing to do whatever it took in order for, he was willing to sacrifice himself for us, me, my sister and my mom, and for us to have that opportunity to have it. And I was able to put, he put me in the environment with all the kids who had all the best opportunities, all the nicest things, got to go to all the the hockey games or the sports games. Like I didn't have to live, you know, eight mile down the street. I got to live in the nice, you know, nice neighborhood with all the rich kids, you know? And I saw my dad do that. And I knew that I want, I could do that too. You know, my, my dad can do it. I can sacrifice too. And I can get something from it. And he taught me a lot of empathy and what it's like to be poor. So we go went back to Mexico when, when I was like seven, eight, nine, we go two, three times a year. And he'd, like, give me a bunch of money. And he'd say, hey, go have fun. And then he said, go take your friends, though. I'm like, okay. And I didn't realize, like, my friends didn't have any didn't money. Didn't have any money. They had yeah. nothing. Like, some of the kids were walking around their underpants. Or some of them didn't have clothes. So, the reality like, is, is you're rich. Clothes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. like this rich kid. I'm not rich, but there, I'm Got you. That's low. what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, I'm this, like, king. And I didn't. And then when I came back, I was like, wow. That is something that I can do. I want to protect people. I want to help people. There's other people besides the world is a lot bigger than I think it is. And I'm willing to do what it takes to, to, to reach top level, to help people. I think that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to give back and just the way, the same way my dad gave back. And I saw that through sacrifice that was possible. Yeah. There's a calling there, it, man. Like I've talked to a lot of people sort of sat on these things and, and elsewhere and they all have a similar story. And what I mean by that is everybody's story is different, but they all figured it out at a fairly young age that they're not a snowflake, right? And that they had somebody in their life, generally a parent or somebody close to them, like an adult, you know, figure that showed them that the world was bigger than them and that the thing that the thing that they should be working for is also bigger than them, right? And they had to sleep on a few couches. Right. And they had to, they had to suffer, um, and, and to fight for kind of what they had and you're literally fighting now. Right. So, um, let's talk about that. I mean, so if you're going to test yourself, there's a lot of ways to do that. There's doing it in the dojo, right. Or in the gym, which is limiting, right. There's doing it on the street, which is very dangerous for a lot of different reasons and doesn't make a lot of sense unless you Unless you have to, right? Or uh, want to spend some time in jail, neither of which are good <laughs> good places to be. And then there's there there's world-class fighting, right? They're stepping into things like cages. And at the time, 
we were just going through the timeline here. I'm kind of doing the math. This is when we're starting to see cage fighting kind of hit the scene. Right. Right. In the early nineties or yeah. Early yeah. mid nineties. Well, like in two, I got, I started fighting in the cage in like 2000. I didn't start fighting until 2007. Okay. Got you. All right. So, but I remember when in ni- in the early nineties, so I remember being a teenager and watching UFC in my friend's garage. My friend's dad was a biker. He like we they he painted bikes and they worked on he's a mechanic okay. and you know he's a hardcore dude. And they brought, you know, they brought that into the garage and like, hey, watch this shit. It's kind of gnarly. Look at this little Brazilian guy. Uh, it was wild, <laughs> man. Dude, like, <laughs> I mean, back in those days when that shit came on, it mm-hmm. was like you had Royce Gracie against Chemo. Yeah, exactly. The two mm-hmm. like most opposite guys in the world. And, and none of us had heard about BJJ before. I had no idea. It was so obscure. I had no idea. What we had, what we had grown up with was, you know, Kung Fu on TV, blood sport. So there was some, like, some knowledge of, like, kickboxing or whatever. And uh, that's pretty much it. Like, I mean, that's what we knew as martial arts. When that little wiry dude got out in the, in the ring with his gi on and absolutely smoked the, every single person that walked in, everybody was like, what the hell is this? Like the guy's sitting down and laying on his back because this doesn't make any sense. We, it was so obscure, right, at, at that point. How did that impact you? I just thought I was just so intrigued by how the fuck did this little guy yeah. just crush, just fucking <laughs> choke this giant out. Yeah. I want to know that shit. Like he was I want to know that shit. Yeah. I need that part of my repertoire, you know, like I need that. You know, just like you watch Van Damme doing all these things, you realize that some of the stuff that you see on TV it's just what it is. It's the movies. Yeah, it's acting. You know, it's all acting. And then you try to do it in like real life and you get your ass beat. But then you see the other stuff and it's real. Like, wow. Wow. I'm fucking, I want to fuck with that shit. Right, right. I need to get down with that. I need to learn it. I, I need to, I, I want to know everything about it because that for me, I'm a martial artist. I, I remember being a kid, just like we were doing today about hypotheticals, scenario. Um, one of the things that was beat in my head was awareness. And it wasn't by my coach. It was by my dad. And I think that was because he came from another country by himself young that he had to be hyper vigilant because people were trying trying to take advantage of him constantly. Sure, sure. You know, being 15 years old, coming from Mexico, crossing the border, you know, like, dude, nowadays even worse. But back then you're 15, you're naive. You don't know. He said, he's remember telling me, just be aware because you don't know what people are capable of and you can't trust anybody, especially when you don't know, you know, arms. My dad be telling me this stuff. So it's, it's that hyper vigilance that you're being aware of. And I remember that jujitsu gave that to me. Like that was that, that moment where I got choked. It was like, wow. It was like that eye opening experience that fuck everything I knew was just wrong. <laughs> you know, and I want to know this shit. I want to know what's real. Right. I, need, I need it. It was almost like a, uh, an, an addiction. It was a hunger. It was a thirst. I want, I was thirsty for this knowledge. Yeah, so that turns into the going on and actually having a test. So talk to us about the test. Like, what was the first real test for you? The first test for me was, <clears throat> so I, I was a white belt, and I thought I was a badass. All right? like I was 17 years old. I'd been training for about a year and a half. And my friends, are, I have a bunch of friends that are older than me. They went to college uh, at UCSB, at UC Santa Barbara. So I remember that in that time, uh, Paragon was in, is in Sarah, Santa Barbara. I don't know if you guys know Jeff Glover yep. or yeah, Jeffy was a purple belt at the time or no blue belt. And Frangia had his school over in Santa Barbara. And one of my best friends was good friends with Jeffy. So he was saying, Oh, are you going to come down for the tournament this weekend? We'll party after, you know, like I'll oh, party after. Yeah, I'm down. So let's go. So I, my first test was, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to fucking tap all these guys here at this tournament. You know, all these adults, I'm going to enter the adult division. I'm, I just turned 17. <laughs> you know what I mean? Dude, I'm seeing some, I'm a white belt, but dude, I'm like seeing some gnarly wrestlers, some like adult. Some like people 30, with skill. Yeah, well, 30-year-old dude. And these are and, grown men. Yeah, yeah grown men. Yeah. Like they're filled out, like strong. Like God, like they've been lifting for a while too, you know? They're not just martial, they're not just wrestlers. They've been like lifting weights. They're strong. They're just got old man strength. You know I got mean? you. I remember being like, I don't know if you remember that now, like, damn, that guy's got some old man strength. Damn. You know? Um, <laughs> I, that's all I was encountering the entire time is old ministry, but I wanted to test myself because I thought I was a badass. I had air. I worked out a little bit. I, I loved to run at that time. I felt like I could outrun you anybody. Had an engine, yeah. I had an engine, dude. And you couldn't stop me. Um, so I went out, I went to 
to Santa Barbara. I outperformed everyone. I got first place. And that was the first test. Ever since I was 12 years old, I worked, you know, for my dad or for someone else. And I worked my ass off to save money and to have things I want. And that's another thing my dad always told me is, you want to play? You got to pay. Right, right. Remember that? Like, yeah, I remember for sure. My, at the one point, I was like, dad, can I borrow the car? He's like, fuck you. Go get your own car. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is my car. My dad loved helping me and giving me stuff. But at the end, like when I was old enough, he's basically said, yo, this is mine. If you want yours, you got to go get your own. That's yeah, a valuable lesson. And I, at that time, I was like, okay, fuck. In my mind, you know, I, I love my dad. You know, <laughs> all right, dad, eat it, you know. But it's like, okay, thank you. But thank you so much, dad, because for doing that. You challenged you, right? You made me the man I am today, you know. So that was a man maker lesson right there. And, or just in, make, making a solid human, you know, like, um, yeah, just be telling you, you got to do your own thing. So, me being down there and then after the th fact, you know, I'm fine on the street. I'm, I'm cocky. You're all fired up. All right. fired up. You like, just got that validated. Was my test. I got validated. And then I basically like, and people at and in the college, I don't know if everyone knows about UCSB, but yeah, that's like the number one party place ever. And I'm like thinking I'm badass and I'm the king of my school at the time. I'm a senior in school. I, I'm like the king of the school because I'm training jujitsu and no one could touch me. I already beat the shit out of all the bullies that fucked with me when I was a kid. Like, that was the other thing. Like before I even went and competed, I made sure that I fucked up every single like bully that ever fucked with me. I have a problem and, with bullies too, man. And so just, I get it. Yeah. just put my, just, just said, Hey, yo, bro, guess what? You ain't fucking with me anymore. I know shit. I don't give a fuck if you're big. Fuck your bigness, dude. I'm going to smash you. And then one guy I remember in the, in the middle of the quad, some guy bitch slapped me with his binder in my face and I fucking choked the shit out of that guy in school. And then it was fuck. It was funny because he was such a dick that the shop teacher actually kind of like took his time to go break up the fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's like, and then and then after the, a couple other teachers like, good job, Ralph. Right, right. He really needed it. They <laughs> the patted enforcer. me on the back. Yeah. So I feel like there's a but then it happened coming right now. Yeah. So what was it? When it happened was when I went to EPA. Like when I really tested myself was when my co one of my coaches brought me to um, East Palo Alto. And I had to train with Eugene Jackson and Tim Lasik. Okay. I don't know if you know those guys. I know Lasik, but I also know that EPA is a uh, equally rough part of uh, the Northern California area. So Very rough. You're not you're not walking into uh, yeah you're not wa walking into um, Beverly Hills. That's for sure. So there's a uh, a boxing gym in Redwood City called Gladiators Boxing yeah. Academy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, back in the day. I was like preparing myself to get ready to fight. And like, this was the time, like this was the test for me to see if I could even hang or be in the right, like if I knew that what I was doing was on the right path. And it was basically like getting Eugene ready and Tim ready for another UFC fight. Mm -hmm. You know, and those guys were the only local legends in the area that were fighting in the UFC. Mm -hmm. So I basically testing myself against a UFC fighter. And so going to the gym, <clears throat> and those guys fucking beat the shit out of me. They're just a punching bag. Dude, they beat the fuck out of me. And I was like, oh, fuck. I'm not doing what I think I need to do. So that's the wake-up moment. That was the aha moment where it's like, okay, stop partying. Stop doing this. Start getting real with it. You're not doing enough. You think you're doing enough, but it's not even fucking close. So a year of that, 19 years old, 20 years old now, go back in there. I'm solid purple belt, fucking strong. I'm lifting weights too a little bit now. I got the engine. I got some confidence. I've been doing a couple jujitsu tournaments and my coach is like, Hey guys, he needs to get ready because we're getting him ready for a fight. And I'm like nervous just going in I'm like, last time these guys fucking hurt me, dude. And like they fucking slammed me and fucking threw me around. I was a little fucking kid before like I could beat up, you know, I can, I can hang with yeah, you're, I, you're, this is next level shit. Yeah, I could hang with some amateur wrestler guy. I could hang with a guy who went to school wrestling. You know, if you graduated college and you were an all American wrestler, okay, I can hang. I'll choke you. But you're talking about like all American Tim Lasik, uh, UFC veteran training with Eugene and a bunch of guys and jiu jitsu black belts. And dude, there was like five jiu jitsu black belts around in that time at, in, in all of California. And I'm like, fuck, dude. And these guys are way bigger than me. I'm 175 pounds. Both these guys are 200 plus. Tim's yeah, like 230, mm. you know, monster, monster. And I remember going into the gym that day and thinking to myself, my coach saying like, hey, you ready for this? You, these guys don't have monster anymore. 
you the fucking monster. I love that. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> fuck yeah. <laughs> fuck yeah. So that was, then I went in and I was like, I didn't care what they were going to do to me. I was strong. I was battle ready. I was going to competitions. You know, I scrapped a little bit with all my friends. All the local boys would come in. Sure. I'd line them up and they'd fucking try to hurt me. And I'd tap everyone. Right. So by that time, I was ready. And I knew I was doing as much, if not more than those guys, you know, at the time. You know, they're a little bit older than me too. So they're on their way out. But still, I was able to compete at that level. That's the time when you put it in though. When yeah. you're resilient like that. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you, yeah. And I remember the guys like, what the fuck happened to this kid? What did you do? What did you do? And he's like, he's hungry. Yeah. So tell us about, I think I heard you say you came in as a purple belt. Tell us about when you got your black belt. You remember that? Yeah. So um, I had just, so I was competing at the U.S. Open. And um, I was competing against who I, Nick Diaz. I was fighting. So Nick Diaz was in the division. We were both brown belts. I'd be hard pressed to find anybody that doesn't know who that is. Yeah. I don't know if you guys know who Nick Diaz is, but yeah, I'm the Nick Diaz guy. <laughs> He's pretty good. Um, and at that time, I had already competed against Nick. Uh, or no, no, not Nick, Nate. I had competed against Nick and Nate. Nick beat me as a purple belt. So I, it wasn't, guy had a hell of experience. I was still coming up. I'm learning. Um, you know, he beat me. He fucking beat me. Whatever. I learned. I grew. I ended up competing against Nate right after that. I beat Nate for a couple points or whatever. And then I I battled Nick in jiu-jitsu at the U.S. Open in Santa Cruz. And so you guys were back on the mat again. Yeah, we're back on the mat as brown belts now. And this is a couple of years later. Uh, I had, it was like, an, what was it? It was like a round robin. And because there's only three of us in the division. I beat Nick the first round by a couple of points. And um, he ended up tapping the other guy right after. And I knew he was fucking. He's like, well, you, don't, you don't lose against me. You're fucking Nick Diaz, right? right yeah. And um, I beat him again, dude. I beat him twice in a day. And my coach was like, holy shit. Okay. All right. Use your black belt. Sorry, Nick Diaz. That was the, that was the test. That was the test. Like, you can beat Nick Diaz. And Nick Diaz just tapped twice down Makako. And he's fighting in the UFC. He's pride fucking champion. You know? You beat that guy. You, you're You're okay. <laughs> you know that's a solid day on the mat yeah man. and at that time too i was already competing in like the, the national championships other other tournaments um and i'd been winning I'd, i i don't even know if i lost for that i didn't lost since i was a since i lost nick in the purple belt division or maybe in an open division i lost by like a couple points against like a, a ultra heavyweight or something so one thing about fighting is it can't go on forever right i mean that's you you either learn that pretty quick and you recognize you're on the clock and you make some smart decisions or do you think you can stay in it forever and you just keep trying to grind out and squeeze out and get back from the sport everything you've kind of put into it and you see some people make real real big mistakes they're kind of career career mistakes you know like it's one thing to to walk out sort of knowing you know what i've reached my prime i'm beyond this but i haven't taken too many hits to the head yet i haven't been embarrassed I still have my pride. I have, I have my dignity, but you see a lot of other people really make some poor decisions there. Mm-hmm. At what point did you know, like, Hey, this isn't a long game for me. I have to be smart about this, right. With regard to the competition piece, because at some point it turns into a business for you. And I'm trying to find kind of where that all happened. So <clears throat> I remember we were talking earlier and I gave you kind of like a little background and origin um, story about, how I got into martial arts and how I made it sustainable. Um, I knew when I was in a senior in high school that that's the model that I had to pick because I'd been training for so long and I knew and my uncle, my uncle is a, uh, my mom's brother. He is, how do I say this without dissing him on, on this podcast? <laughs> Um, well, that's on you. He's a, he's a realist. <laughs> I'm standing by. Yeah, he's a realist. No, he's a realist, but sometimes you can be a dick about it, okay. you know? And he'd always tell me, he's like, Ralph, there's always somebody better than you. There's always somebody better than you. I'm like, fuck, dude. I know that, dude. But I'm, one day, you know, every, so, unk, every dog's got his day and my day is going to come, you know? So I haven't lived in, I haven't sit in the sun yet. So I want to get there in the sun. But anyway. I knew that at 16 years old or 17 years old doing my senior exit project for high school um, that in interviewing a lot of different fighters that I wasn't able, I wasn't going to be able to sustain being a professional fighter, a prize fighter. So I shifted my focus. I shifted my project to 
how to become a professional martial artist. And a professional martial artist doesn't always need to fight. Sometimes you fight, but then you share, you teach, and you run your business off a passion that you have. Um, Before it sucked out of you. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, So I understood that going in. So when I went in, I opened up my own school. I opened, I, I asked my parents, hey, mom, dad, I'm not going to school. I hate college. I'm not going to go to college. And my grandma saved up a little bit of money for me. And my, uncle, my other uncle let me borrow some money. So I was able to crowdsource some stuff and start a business that would fuel my passion. That and, is a lot of self-awareness for a kid. And that comes from my dad teaching me at a young age, you want to play, you got to pay. You got to earn your own stuff. I worked my own way. I wanted a car. When I was a kid, I saw, what did I see? I saw a Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo with the new music and the beat, but it costs like 15 grand. And my dad's like, fuck you, I'm not yeah, buying that. Right. You know, so I had to find a way. I found a way. I had to work for it. I hustled and I grinded and I found a way and I got it. You know, so just understanding that you need to, you have to work. You know, you get out what you put in. You reap what you sow. You know, and nothing in this life is free. Nothing. Like you might think it's free, but you're going to have to pay something in the back some, end. Yeah, some place, you know, somebody some might give you something, but you know what? There's strings attached. It's very rare where you find someone who's so genuine, who gives you something that you don't, they don't care about having anything back. I try to practice that as much as I possibly can. I'm only human, not perfect, but I try to do that with my students in, the, in my community. And I feel like that's one of the reasons why I've had some success is because I'm a giver and I don't, I'm not expecting anything back. If it comes back, awesome. If it doesn't, I really don't give a shit. I just did it because I wanted to. Right, the right thing for sake of doing the right thing and because it made you feel good. And right. So maybe, maybe it gets paid for. Long story so. short, my parents raised me as an entrepreneur and business mindset, I guess, growing up. Like that we ran the fish trap here in Half Moon Bay and my parents run the fish trap. They helped, they built that place. Like that place was built off of their back. My dad's worked there for 40 years. Wow. Um, mom, grandma, same thing. So I understood, you know, how to make a dollar from 15 cents, you know, in that aspect. And if you're going in, this is advice for anybody going into this field and wanting to make this a lifelong career, you should come into this with some sort of financial education. Because if you come in here with just pure raw talent, you're going to get the sharks out there, all those managers, all these people, the banks, the government, the taxes. You need to understand how all that shit works. Because you're going to go take a fight. Oh, I got paid 20 grand. And all of a sudden they take 40% of that shit and you already spent all the money. And now you owe fucking like 4,000, 5,000 bucks that you don't got. Sounds like you may have done this before. You know, so <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of fighters. I also have a, a top tier fighter in Bellator right now. I fought for Strike Force. Um, you know, I know the who's who. You've been I, around. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've trained the AK. I've been at AKA with Javier Mendez for the last 15 years too. He was one of my mentors as well. Um, that's the gym I went to to start learning how to fight, you know, in San Jose. Um, so I've been around. That's the, like the Mecca. Yeah. I've been yeah. around the who's who like could be uh, Luke Rockhole is one of my good buddies. It could be was, uh, training with Adam for a couple of years when he was, when he was in his, in, in his prime. Um, so I, DC, I remember being at AK before DC was there. I remember when Kane first showed up, I remember John Fitch was a white belt, like I remember these things and I've seen people win. I've seen people lose. I've heard the stories and I've kind of like. They don't teach you this shit in school. No, they don't teach this shit to you in school. None of this stuff. Financial education, you got to go externally to learn that stuff. So I highly recommend that if you want to make something out of your talent, you first have to understand how a business actually works and what the infrastructure looks like or what details behind, or at the very least, bring a partner on who has that kind of knowledge that you really trust and then you put things on a piece of paper and you like a contract yeah you'd be professional and adult exactly about it. you want to be a pro fighter you act like a fucking pro don't act don't start great advice you know don't do things off of handshakes pats on the back because at the end of the day everyone's going to take everything from you and you're not going to have anything left and you're going to want to be all, the only thing you're going to be have from that is is bitterness and resentment yeah, I think I've heard that. Like, if you're not looking out for your your own priorities, there's a whole long line of people that'll go ahead and do it right for you. Oh, yeah. If you're not careful. 100%. Yeah. So, before we get into sort of the, some of the things we covered today, I think we have some kind of some technical questions. There's things we want to talk about specific to um, situational awareness, applicability of different martial arts and kind of how they, well, again, applicability, I think is the right word. But I maybe just a quick question I have for you is what's the 
what's the reality of this business that you have, right? I mean, uh, well, I see a couple of different models, right? I've seen your model and maybe a couple other ones that, that function similarly. Um, and I'll, we can circle back to that and you can kind of explain that in a little bit more detail. But I've also seen, and I grew up around this, and it bothers me that I've seen other martial arts models that, to be quite frank, uh, it's a fucking racket, man. Like I, I Mick Dojo? Mick Dojo. <laughs> and it looks like one of the things I was exposed to. So my, 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 um, actually, the nine year old has been through a very, sort of had a very good jujitsu experience. And that's part, partially just kind of awareness by, by her mom and I and, you know, <clears throat> making sure she gets in the right spot. But, <laughs> my my uh my older daughter went through swim school and if any parent has ever been through the local swim school whatever that is it's just a fucking turnstile you know you're paying this monthly fee the kids are in and in and out of the water in exactly 22 minutes 35 you know 35 seconds they bring the next kid in and it's like what are my kids really what's my kid really learning here it's literally a turnstile it's like a factory right and they just keep you coming back like well you know little Johnny just graduated to tadpoles from, you know, whatever. And then, you know, they move it to the next thing. I'm like, okay, so the kid can hold their breath, right. And can swim because you can't get any, there's so many damn kids and instructors in the pool. Like they can't swim further than five feet. So they can go from like the middle of the pool to the edge of the pool. Oh, good. You graduated. You're at, you know, whatever ribbon, whatever. Right. And, you, and they just keep, ribbon. <laughs> they keep feeding the thing. And I've seen it in martial arts too. Where it's like, there's a thousand belts. Right. And the, each belt has a hundred stripes mm -hmm. and they just keep moving you through it. And at the end of the day, like to your, to your, your point earlier, like at what point, you know, do we recognize that? What are we really teaching kids? Now I'm not saying that they're not taking away good things there. There's mm -hmm. community, there's physical fitness, right? There's a sense of self-discipline. There's showing up when you don't want to, there's putting out when you don't want to, there's learning lessons that go into that. But as it relates to actually learning a skill that where you could apply it, I've seen some really shitty stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say the people that are behind that aren't really trying to do the right thing. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm, that's not to say that the parents that have their kids in there are doing their kids a disservice and that they're dumb for doing it. I'm just looking at it going, well, that's not my brand of martial arts. So if that's good for you, go ahead. So, but it looks like a racket to me, man. It looks like a racket. So that's kind of either end of the spectrum. Maybe you can talk a little bit about your experience in this business and what you've seen and how you've been successful. So going back to my own experience as a child, like I remember that too. Like you would have to do these tests. You'd have to learn these forms. You have to do all these things and you get a belt. And if you're the belt, then you'd think that you're at this thing. And the reality is it's not until you actually have to apply the skill where you know you're at, where you're actually at. And it's just like any other form of preparation. Let's say I go to school to become a cook. I'm not going to get hired for a job if I wasn't a good cook, and, right. you know? Right. So th there's the skills you take away. Um, going back to like the McDojo mind, uh, mindset. Yeah, it's a business for a lot of people. They want to have people come in, come out. It's marketing. They're going to show you and sell you this product that you think you're going to buy, mm -hmm. this confidence. And then you're going to get put to the test and realize it doesn't work. Um, I do not like, again, there's value to that depending on what kind, who you're trying to con like to uh, trying to affect or touch. I mean, like trying to influence. Um, but I think for the majority of it, and especially the way I teach, I want to make sure that children or people are equipped with tools that will actually work for them. And that's tailored for them. So if you're going into a dojo and say, you need to learn this and this from start to finish, that is what an example of what a McDojo is. And if you go into a dojo where they custom tailor something for you and what your special, your exact needs are, and then use those to apply them in the real life, that's where I would see there's more value into trying to find a gym. I think that crosses over into like what JP and I do on a regular basis. I mean, there's groups of people that are coming in to get a workout program in, right? Or get, get a workout. They want to work out with the group. There's a varying skill levels, but it's up to the co and ability and fitness levels. It's up to the coach to manage that group of people and also mm -hmm. have the tough conversation with somebody who doesn't have any business being in that session because they're underskilled, underconditioned. There's issues and we need to look out for not only you, your safety, your health and provide better, the best value for you. But also we have all these other people we got to look out for. Right. And then uh, 
there's also the people who are coming in for more of the really strictly personalized stuff. Um, but the McDojo thing, it's like, it's a one size fits all across the board. This is where you start. This is where you move. I mean, maybe it's based on age groups or whatever. There's mm-hmm. some parameters, but literally everybody learns the same thing no matter what. And we see that in the gyms too. Everybody gets the same workout today and there's really no coaching. There's instruction. Like this is the exercise. This is what you do, but there isn't an adjustment made for the, for the, for the consumer or for, for whoever the person is. That's also a very tough thing to do, right? Like if, as a business owner, it's not easy to do that. It takes a high level of awareness. You have to have great coaches on the floor that recognize how to do this. As a business owner, you have to give them autonomy as a coach to be able to, you know, do the right thing for the client that's sitting in front of them in, in uh, whatnot. How do you find those people? How do you manage all that? Or are you managing it all by yourself? Um, <clears throat> right now the business is run by my wife and I, and, um, yeah, we just busted out on our own. We've been doing it for years and years. And I, I have people come in and help. I have my fighter. He teaches one class. Uh, Adam teaches one class. Matt teaches one Adam's class. Teach, Adam's teach Adam teaches a class. Oh, that's great. He used to be my kid's instructor, but a little context for Adam. I've been training Adam since he was 16 years old too. And from white belt all the way up to black belt. And, um, how I taught him was in the kid's class because we, how are we going to, train in a nice place like that and keep the lights on, you know, right. We gotta, we gotta make sure that the, the lights stay on. So we had in, in the beginning of the afternoon, we taught two kids classes that would basically pay for our rent. And then everything else was just fun. And we would do what we wanted to do. And we didn't care if people wanted to learn or not. This is what we were teaching. This is the real thing. If you want it, you want it. If you don't, you don't. And I wasn't in the beginning. I didn't care about making money. I just cared about getting good and making my students really good. And that late, and then later on, we can go ahead and apply our skills or our, you know, our expertise in any way we wanted to. So I invested in myself first, and then I invested into the business. into a model, yeah, yeah. some type of model. And I don't want anyone in my gym that I don't trust. I don't bring people in from anywhere, and if I do, it's like I know them, and I've known them for a long time, and I have to vet them because they're working with my community. The community in my my gym is my baby. You know, you're literally watching my baby and everybody else in it. And I'm a role model of the year in, in half from Bay 2000. Yeah. This is no bullshit by the way. So I was going to bring this up. Like the, the, the city of half moon Bay has, has awarded you role model of the year. Correct. Because of the work that you do with by the chamber of commerce. Yeah. yeah. By the chamber of commerce. But the, and you're not, are you even a member of the chamber? No. And that time I was not a member of the chamber <laughs> yeah. of commerce. So they're even reaching out to you. <laughs> I'm just, I'm That's just, how much influence you have. Yeah. I have a the, lot of influence the youth, over the community. The, the youth, parents, the community. Right. I I grew up in Half Moon Bay. Um, I I grew up with most of my my students' kids, parents. Um, I mean, the, most of my students uh, who have kids uh, and and their parents too. They're either my teacher or they were my call, like my yeah. friend in school. That's special. And um, I, it's it's generational. So I and I my my family grew up too in Half Moon Bay. I, they run the fish trap. It literally is family. It's, there's a yeah, trust. We, we a have a huge. There. We have a very tight knit community. Half Moon Bay is small. Um, it's not the typical community. It's not San Jose. It's not, it's very small. Um, there's one, there's two ways in, right. two, there's three ways in three ways out. Right. 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 And there's like one is highway one and one. Yeah. One's kind of a bypass, but yeah. Yeah. Right. Like there's <laughs> yeah. highway one and we're on the coast, yeah. you know, we're like that best kept secret type thing. We're like Maverick. I don't know if you know where Mavericks. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, Mavericks. Yeah. So like we are like the little Hawaiian town here in, in California that, you know, I grew up and I, I want to protect it. And so a place special like this, there has to be a watchdog out there because things are changing. Things are changing fast. And I'm not mean like watchdog where I have to watch out for people coming on the beach and the kids the crossing over because the kids do that too. They flex on the, the kids that from high school come over the hill. They don't want to fight or whatever. Oh, this sure. That, that, that's that's age old shit. That's I'm the- talking about like protecting the values that we had growing up here in this community that like now kids can't even go outside anymore without their parents being paranoid about their kids running around and riding their bike on the street. Like I remember I grew up free range. Like there was a dirt road on airport road and I lived next to the Moss Beach distillery and I was in the bluffs. Me and my friends were swimming out in the Mavericks water out there with no wetsuit, just playing and shit. And then we come home. My parents didn't even know I was at the beach. When the street lights come on. Or yeah, whatever, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And now it's like some of those things you can't even do. Like kids can't look at other kids. You can't talk to certain people. Um, the kids are scared. They don't have the same confidence. They, they don't practice this. They don't surf anymore. They don't go outside. It's all video games now. Everything's tech. 
You know, the things are the things that used to be um, valued here on the coast are now so rare. And I'm trying to keep that stuff alive. And I want the next 15 year old kid coming up being successful. I want the next, I want to see another me coming out. Right, to feel the day. same as you. Yeah. yeah. And like there was Adam before, I mean, Adam after me. And now there's, and I'm not working with just kids anymore that are in martial arts. I'm trying to take it further than that. And I'm just thinking about athletes who have dreams and aspirations and mentoring them and making sure that they have the best chance possible and to give them a facility where they can do that. Because in Halfway Small, I grew up here in a small karate studio. There was no gym. Like the gym you had was at the high school, old equipment. You can't even go there unless you're on a, one of the varsity sports teams. And, or, or the, the, the local gym that cost $200 a month, like 30 years ago or 25 years ago to go to, you, no one could go to that gym, right. you know? So I want to make sure that there's a place and there's a, and there's the mentality where people can reach for their dreams constantly. I, I want to keep that shit alive because I remember all the mentors when I was growing up, dude, they were, they were rock stars. And they were constantly telling us, oh, you're the next one. You're the next one. You can do it. Let's go. Let's Community go. Community back to you. Yeah. yeah. And now I have like Luca Padua. He, he was, um, he's the youngest kid to ever surf Mavericks. Um, he's been in the gym since he was 15 years old. Right after he did that, one of the local boys brought him in and said, hey, this is the new kid. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, take him under your wing. So Show him what's up. Look out for him. Look yeah. out for him. So what would we do? I gave him a key. I said, hey, Luca, here's a key. Here's some, here's a tub of protein. This is keep, what you got to do. Keep out of trouble. Yeah. And, yeah. and he did. Work out, yeah, stay yeah. here. Come here. Tell all your friends. That's what you're doing. Yeah. And you be the trendsetter. And that's, that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to follow fucking shit. I want to follow my own dream. And I don't want anyone to deter it. And I want the kids in my community to continue to believe that they can do that. And not that there's no chance for them to escape or you have to work at this place or you have to go to school and do tech and you have to do this and that. There's no have to do anything. You have to do what's calling you. You know, so, and I'm here to support that. I'm here to help you protect your dream, you know, because people want to fuck with your dream and people don't care about you. And at the end of the day, others don't care about your dream. Only you give a fuck about your dream, you know? So you got to protect that shit and not just you. If you ever, if you're in a position where you can help someone else and the younger kids protect, protect them, that's what, that's like an obligation. Why wouldn't you do that? You know, it's like watching someone get hurt and you looking the other way. You know, it's the same, ex for me, it's the same shit because it's a perpetual cycle that, that's just going to show, it's just going to teach the kids to get worse and worse and worse in the community. All of a sudden we don't have our, our golden town anymore. Yeah. I think that's a good place to kind of segue into the next thing. I mean, the change that you're mentioning and we're just, you're seeing it. I mean, it's exploding all over. It's not just, you know, happening based on a small place and probably a little bit more controllable than a lot of other places. I mean, down in just, again, we're just 30 miles north of a little bit north of where, where uh, you know, I live and work and uh, JP and I live and work. Or JP lives a little bit further than that east and we're, we're, we're seeing the changes and I don't know. I don't, I don't like it. Like I, I hate it. I, it's, and it's not that I am resistant to change. I'm just, I'm just resistant to the change that I'm seeing. And it's, it's lack of self-awareness. It's lack of self-confidence. It's a sense of entitlement. Um, it's, yeah, fault chasing somebody else's dream because they think that's what they're supposed to do. With very little support system, the the uh, and supporting systems, the resources are being taken away. Kids don't have access to the same shit they did, and this, a lot of the access they do have to things, unless you have wealthy parents that can provide access to those things, the quality of those things continues is, continues to diminish. And I think it spills over. So it spills over into society, and as these kids grow up, they make really poor decisions and they they do really stupid things. And that's kind of brings us to this point, kind of where. JP and I are in terms of kind of our exploration and this, these experiences we're trying to gain, um, to help spread the good word and, and, and affect change, but, or at least affect awareness to, um, things that people can do to change their, their current situation. So for us, our, 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 our time with you today was really set, centered around, you know, more of some self-defense type things because you've, Obviously, you've just went through your resume and all the things that you've done. And I spent some time on the jujitsu mat in a few different places. And I know I'll let JP talk about his his experiences. And it's not been a ton. My any self defense stuff I had to do is a matter of self defense. Um, and I grew up doing some dumb stuff and putting myself in putting myself in situations or not being aware of situations that I shouldn't have put myself in or shouldn't even been there for that where I was sort of trained through the school of hard knocks, if you will. 
um, which then encouraged me to kind of look at a few different places to to get some maybe some more skills to layer on top of what I had to learn on the fly. Um, but the theme today was don't get yourself in those situations, right? And I think that's very easily missed. Uh, people are like, oh, you go to you go to jujitsu or you go to you go to karate or you go to Muay Thai or whatever else so that you can fight people. That's not why I go. That is not why I'm going. <laughs> um, I'm going so that I don't have to do that. But if in the event that something happens, like I want to be able to take care of myself. Um, I think there's a fitness component there. There's a mental and physical component, obviously, that goes along with it too, that's healthy. Um, but um, I, I think that people walk into these things with a different mindset. Now, they see something happen. They have a reaction to it. I need to go learn jujitsu. I need to go learn kickboxing. You know, I need, to, I need to go learn how to use a gun. All right, so there's an emotional drive, but there isn't that there isn't like a goal there. It's not really well put together in their head. It's not fully developed, right? And so the intention really isn't set on um, how to make the most out of this situation. Why am I really doing this in the first place? Um, and I think a lot of that's rooted in fear. I think that's another conversation. But what it ends up doing is it gets people people tunnel vision. Like if I do this and I train this way, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be safe. I mean, in your in your in your story about karate, like you learned the hard way, like all the shit I've been le- learning for years until like I really put it, put to the test. It me- really means nothing because I just got choked out. So what is up? Um, I think I'll just turn over to JP here. I know you had some questions just sort of about the applicability of some of the training that we were doing today uh, and how it crosses over into this protection um, and also servant role that you, you bring to the table. Um, because again, you're protecting your your community, but it's through service, right? How can how can we do that better as a society or as a in, just in this room as a team? Yeah, first of all, that's really cool what you're doing. Because I don't really have any background on you, so that's really cool. I'm actually just sitting here listening, like, damn, that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, um, anytime I'm around, uh, it seems to happen more often now lately that I've been getting more into MMA stuff. Like I have an interest for my own training now. Um, but anytime, How old are you, JP? I'm going to be 32 next okay. month. All right, wait, it's February now, right? This month. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, my background, just real quick, is like, I've been fat my whole life, and I didn't do any fitness until I was like 24. And so, like, since 24 until now, I've just basically just been doing all different forms of training, like firearms, CrossFit, whatever. And so now, like, the next thing is like, I'm trying to learn more fighting stuff. Not because of like the consistent thing which was what you were saying like with confidence people need confidence and so like they're like well fuck i've been bullied and i've been through that too but i didn't really go to that even though that's a consistent thing like i'm gonna learn how to fight because i need confidence and stuff like that which totally makes sense this is just like after doing a bunch of stuff now i'm like i like i'm interested in this stuff i've only done like a little bit of striking but um in terms of like uh, the firearms training and like the practicality of all that kind of stuff. Anytime I'm in like a space with somebody who I feel like knows what they're doing with MMA stuff, I always ask them like, what's actually applicable in terms of like training styles, like competition versus like what we were talking about earlier versus like, what what would you really do? Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if you can just kind of go into that. So what I was discussing about with you guys earlier was um, what is, the best weapon and what's the best defense. And one of the things I said was the best attacker and what Scott said was um, most people have this tunnel vision. They go into martial arts and they want to learn this like five finger death touch and they would think they're going to learn this thing that's going to be the end all, right? When really the best of attack that anyone that happens is a surprise. I, I could know nothing and still fuck you up, you know, as long as you didn't see it coming. You know, yeah, and, and you see that happening out on the street all every the day time. right now. Yeah. And that go, it's going to lead right into what we were talking about before. And again, the, what's the best defense? And that's not to be there. But how do we get these things? And what we were discussing earlier was the awareness and the vigilance and being able to understand what environment you're actually in and not being so naive to think that nothing, I'm going to go out and nothing's going to happen to me. It reminds me of a story one time, my daughter. I love my daughter so freaking much, but sometimes the ignorance of teenagers gets to, like, it gets, it'll catch up to you. 
She thinks, you know, she thinks oh, I can say whatever I want. I'm going to honk at this oh, person. The apple doesn't fall too far from I'm the tree, a, does wanna, it, Dad? I'm going <laughs> to roll the window down and tell this guy, you cut me off. Fuck you. You know, well, she said it to one guy one time and the guy followed her and pinned her down and like. She locked herself in the car and she didn't know what to do. And he was all honking at her. God, are you stupid? Da, 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 da. And then they didn't realize what was going to happen. She got surprised. And all of a sudden she got shook and she never did any shit like that ever again. I saw the best offense not to be there. Best attack is surprise. But more than anything, anticipation, vigilance, um, awareness of the situation, not getting... Not getting in the problem in the first place, knowing what you're actually doing and the consequences of your actions. You can't just say certain things to certain people and think it's going to be okay. Oh, but ah. yeah, but that seems to be totally lost right now. Things are being lost. Because, because they can do it behind a keyboard. They think they can yep, do it on the street. Exactly, Dude, I literally just had this conversation yesterday and the day before uh, with my girl. because She's got road rage. Dude, um, I'm just like, and that's I, hella video. Dangerous. I think I sent that's, a video too where this, is pretty this, spicy. this guy like pulls a gun out and he's just like, fuck it. You want to have road rage? Okay. Yeah. And he just starts popping off and I'm just like, okay, dude, that was, that was up here. That wasn't anything else. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You created that. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, definitely, uh, awareness is something we try to try to practice. And, uh, I think that's really interesting that like I came into your, uh, gym today thinking like, okay, we're probably going to roll around get my ass beat a little bit. And then actually you kind of just preached a lot of the similar things that we already go into a lot of this thinking like, just don't get into trouble. Be very aware of your surroundings and have like a clear mindset and know how to respond to things, right? Protocols are super important, okay? And preparation is super important. If you follow your protocols, if you follow your training, your preparation, you should be fine. There are those cases where, dude, shit just happens, you know, and you have to deal with it in those moments. But for the most part, if you do the right, things are going to be smooth. It's not until you go outside that protocol where you start being lazy, you make mistakes, or you don't care, or you don't think it's going to matter. Your ignorance gets to you. That's when you're vulnerable. When you think, when your ego gets into play. And I see nowadays, it's funny because it's, it's interesting, actually, that a lot of times people's egos are so inflated that they actually revert to childlike mentality. Oh, God. Yeah. So. Most people want to have a conversation with you, but they're so immature and they're so unaware and uneducated about the topic they're talking about that they revert back to that childlike state. And they explode. Yeah. And then they have a fit and a tantrum and the people want to go ahead and be a troll online and say, ah, well, do troll. Guess what, troll? It's just because you don't have the right information. You haven't done the right studying. You haven't done your due diligence, you know, and that's with everything. If you study, you do your due diligence. I hate school. Okay. Don't get me wrong. Don't you oh, study. Raul said you hated school. I fucking hated it. I hated sitting in school doing all those things, but I love fucking martial arts. I love fighting. I like winning. I love like the whole biomechanics behind it. The, the anatomy, the biology of a person. I want to know how to control it. I, I love control. So I went and studied my fucking ass off to understand the elements in all those different areas. And now I can actually, I, the proof is in the pudding, right? Yeah. You know, I can say those things because I've not only have I studied those things, I actually have application. Yeah. You know, I've done, I've not just talked the talk, I've actually walked the walk. And so I've earned that right to get to say these things and share my experiences. Do I think that everything that I do is going to work for every single person across the board? No. However, I do think that proper preparation will help you perform correctly. I do think that you doing your due diligence will help you. I do think that you following your protocols and not be and being aware of your surroundings and anticipating a few things can save your life. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And you don't need to be a, a big, strong guy to do that. You just got to have mental jujitsu. You just have to have visual optical jujitsu. Use your eyes, use your brain, yeah. you know, be smart about what you're, what you're going to say. That guy looks kind of mean or that person looks kind of mean. They got a freaking, you can see the concealed care. You don't walk up to them and tell them their girlfriend's fat. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it's yeah. stupid, dude. Why would you, you don't do shit like that. You know, you don't go up through and you like fucking flex on them. No, dude, yeah. there's things you don't do. Or just don't even be in that same room. Yeah. Yeah. You you get know, out of there. Best offense not to be there. Right. Yeah. You know, and a smart guy, a smart person, they fix a problem. But a wise person will avoid the problem completely. Yeah, that's, that is. A so what are you going to exercise? Your smarts or your wisdom? And if you don't have wisdom yet, you're going to experience something which is going to create some wisdom inside you. 
Yeah, I think that there's a lot to be said for the person that has a little bit of knowledge, just enough to make them dangerous, you know, to themselves and potentially to others. And, you know, you start bringing uh, like a force multiplier to the situation, like a weapon or, you know, a firearm or whatever the, the case is, it can end really, really poorly. Um, stop trying to do black belt shit as a white belt and stop talking and start listening more and start practicing more. Uh, I think that's a huge, it, it, that's a huge piece of advice, but it's also partly understand that this is shit that happens kind of on a daily basis all around us. And you, you hit the nail on the head earlier with regard to the, don't be so naive to think that it's not going to happen to you or somebody that, you know, um, or somebody that's close to you that doesn't have this, this, this awareness. So, um, I, I love what you're doing from the, the I am here to sort of protect and serve, you know, I'm protecting the culture, I'm protecting the environment I'm, I'm in, and I'm doing that through a service to teach people and, and help people, or particularly youth, be aware of the things that they can and can't do and should and shouldn't be doing based on your own experience. Kids become adults, man. Yeah. The kids <laughs> become adults. They, oh, we're seeing the... We're, they grow up. Look at right. that guy right yeah. there. <laughs> we're seeing the consequence of helicopter parenting and not doing these things for, for our youth. Yeah. You, um... I mean, we were talking about sort of the applicability of, of the training. So, you know, a lot of, we see, we hear this a lot sort of in our community and I read it a lot and I'm not law enforcement, I'm not military, I don't have any experience there, but I hear people say, oh, you got to train jujitsu. You got to train jujitsu. Um, and jujitsu is the thing that's going to help you. And if cops just trained more jujitsu, we'd have less, less uh, incidents on the street and, you know, officer involved shootings or violence or whatever the case. I have a big problem with that. Because one, I think what it does is it instills a overinflated level of self-confidence um, that jujitsu is the answer to both the, or l- level of confidence to both potentially officers or those in law enforcement or military or whatever, and also the public as if this is the answer. Because what I have learned, and a lot of it we were, we were covering today, is that it's not. It isn't. There are elements of it that you may be able to use. Certainly learning about body awareness, learning about strength, levers, right? Momentum, body position in space, those kinds of things. Those are all very important things and you can learn those, but it is not the answer. It's not the thing that's going to get you out of trouble every time. I mean, you said it. Tactics. Yes. I think tactics and strategy yeah. is number one. If you don't, jujitsu is a tool, just like the baton, just like the gun, just like any other tool on your belts, just like the walkie, anything else. And used correctly, it can help. It's not the answer. It's just a tool to help you do your job. Coupled with all the other t- tools you have and protocols, you should hypothetically be able to, um, within a certain percentage, an acceptable percentage, be able to subdue somebody a little bit easier. However, if you use it with false confidence and you think that's the end all and that's the answer to all these things, you're sadly mistaken because you're going to find yourself in a situation where that's not going to work for you. The person's too big or you're not experienced enough or you don't have that level of expertise or you're tired or you got injured, you slipped. Anything can freaking happen, especially when you're on the clock, on the job, in a job like that. It's more about tactical awareness, I think, and just situational awareness more than it is knowing jujitsu. And from the skills perspective, enter the whole MMA or mixed martial arts and having kind of a combination of tools and also training for whatever the reality of your situation is, right? Like, so as an officer, if I'm an officer out there, and again, I don't claim to be one, I don't have any idea what it's like to do that job. I've never had any experience, but their job is to take the fight to the criminal or take the fight to the street and, and subdue this person, cuff this person, whatever, get them in the back of a vehicle. That is not John, John Q citizen, right? John no. Q citizen is not, that is not their job, right? That is not in their purview. Their job is to get keep themselves safe and self defense, get the hell out of there, get home at the end of the day, just like the officer, but but in a different way. Like I'm, I shouldn't be. Again, I'm not the aggressor here. If I'm being the aggressor, you're already fucked up, right? Like you, you, yeah, you, you, you then you've messed the whole situation up to begin with. But I guess my point being, taking, getting educated, doing training in things that make sense for you. And the things that you may need to do. And if you don't have 10 years, or in your case, it was a short five, but if you don't have 10 years to earn a black belt in jujitsu, like what can you do? Like where, where can you go? What should you do? How could you be looking for somebody to educate me if you don't live in Half Moon Bay? 
Well, listening to this podcast right now is really good. You know, following pod, your podcast uh, and also following some of the people that you're interviewing and, and listening to these podcasts and you can get different perspective and you can actually like get a more uh, educated consensus of what you want because a lot of times people don't know what they don't know. Right. You said that earlier that, oh, they don't know what you don't know. And that's so true. So finding someone that you're drawn to, listen to them a little bit, research them, do your due diligence, and then you can make a, a, an educated guess or an informed assessment of what you want to do. Right. right. That's solid advice. Yeah, so, be just like to grabbing a coach to learn how to get healthier or more fit or anything else. Like know who your not, coach is. Yeah, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Vet your coaches. Yep, vet your coach. Don't just show up to 24-hour fitness, give them 500 bucks and say, okay, which trainer is mine? You get some guy. Pick one off the wall here. Dude, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and the guy's out back smoking cigarettes, you know, and going to Burger King. You know, that's not my trainer, dude. I don't want that guy influencing me. I want somebody who knows what they're talking about. I want someone knowledgeable. I want someone that's familiar. And I want someone who I believe, I believe can trust me and that I can even vibe with. You have to be on the same wavelength. If you're, if you have all the knowledge in the world, but I can't receive the information that you're laying yep. down, that's not going to work for me. It's yeah. not going to work at all, period. Yeah. You got to find someone else. Yeah. I think just like, just because you paid the fee doesn't mean you're going to get what the value. Yeah. We always talk about that mm -hmm. uh, with fitness too. Like it doesn't matter how smart you are. If you're not able to, de to deliver that message, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? You're not, you're not built to be a coach if that's not the case, you know? Um, one thing that you did talk to us about earlier, which is like creating distance and like being aware and everything like that. Um, that seems to be consistent with everybody when we're talking about self-defense. Like it doesn't matter if you're like special forces or MMA or any of that. So like, I think that's, that's pretty cool to hear like all walks of life that are professionals say like self-defense is like pretty much the answer is be aware and get away. Control the distance. Yeah. You want to control the distance. You so what do I mean by controlling the distance? If someone's walking towards me, don't get paralyzed with fear and stand there. Take a few steps back. Right. You know, make sure you maintain the distance. You controlled it. They walked forward. You walk back. You know, they walk for you. Don't walk forward towards the danger. You continuously move away from the danger. I mean, that sounds like such common sense. Yeah. But it's it's you, funny because people always want like, and like I was asking earlier in terms of scenarios, people always want like, a, yeah, I do like this exact thing every time. No. And it's not that. No. Nope. Because it's not the same situation. Ever. Yeah. Always different. Even as many times as I practice that grip break thing, I grabbed you different every time. Yeah. Yeah. So listen, man, I mean, I, I can't thank you enough for the time that we spent today uh, just in picking your brain a little bit and, and man, the enthusiasm and the passion you have, um, what you provided just to us in the private, you know, hour and a half that we got to spend together was, was amazing. Uh, and, um, it was my pleasure. You, you, well, I could, I have to, I have to be honest. It seemed like you're enjoying it. And that's what I loved about it. Like, cause yeah. you love what you do. You're clearly passionate about it and it, it bleeds out of you. And it's no, there's no, no question in my mind why you've been so successful and why you are the role model of the year here in half moon Bay. I mean, I think, um, you know, people, you know, people should aspire to run businesses that do the things that you're doing and, 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 and be like Raul. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, dude, I just want to see everybody win. Yeah, you know, you don't have to that. be like me. You just got to try to be the best you. Right. And if you can be the best you by looking at me being the best me, go for it, bro. Like, go for it. I love that. And that's just me. I'm just trying to be my authentic self. And if it motivates you some way, fuck yeah, dude. And let's go. Well, we should definitely, I'm motivated to come back up and do some yeah, training. Yeah, I was, was going <laughs> to say, man, I'm definitely down to come back and do some training. I want to um, shoot some I wish guns. I lived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude. <laughs> dude, we can make that happen. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely need to do that soon. I, I mean, there's, there's a whole group of community of people that you have, and there's a whole that you're you're connected with on a on a regular basis. A whole group of you know people or community that we're connected on a regular basis share similar values, share similar goals. There's alignment there, and we should get them together. Energy, uh, I love it. Yeah, man. I mean, we need more of that. We need more of the communities to come together. And even though we're 30 miles down the road, that it, it's literally your backyard, you know. So, um, listen, man. I mean. I don't know what it is that we can do to help you with your business right now. We should talk about that, but maybe you could just tell people a little bit about, you know, how to f get in contact with you or find you and learn more about you if they wanted to be on the, be on the podcast. Um, you guys can check us out. We have another little podcast that um, we're doing for fun. It's called dudes with experience. Uh, it's just a fun little, little group of us guys talking crap about 
like real things, day to day stuff. What was one of the things that we talked about last time? Mentor. We actually talked about mentorship and how to find a, a good mentor or what is expected from a mentee as well. Um, but otherwise, if you're in Hafun Bay, you guys want a nice place to stay and train, friendly people, friendly atmosphere, stop on my gym. Um, you can check us out online. Check out our website or Instagram, Ralph Steel Martial Arts. Um, but other than that, find someone that you guys trust. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be me. It doesn't have to be um, exactly here in Half Moon Bay. But if you can find someone that you gravitate towards, that you trust and believe in, and that you've done your due diligence on, dude, that's where you guys need to be. Thanks so much for your time today, bro. Thanks for having me on the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. It's really cool. I enjoyed the story.